My Gabonin folks, more integrals, and today we have an interesting trig one. <clears throat> we have the integral from 0 to infinity of sine of alpha x times sine of beta x over x squared. Okay, cool. That's interesting. So we have a product of trig functions. So it would be nice to use one of those product to sum formulae. And we need a product of sine functions. That is, we need sine of alpha x terribly sorry about that, times the sine of beta x. So we can get a product of sine functions if we have one half of cosine of alpha minus beta x minus cosine of alpha plus beta x. That way the cosines cancel out and then you have the product of sines left behind. Perfect. So that means i here is in fact the integral from zero to infinity of what exactly? Wait, we have this factor of one half outside and we have cosine of alpha minus beta x minus cosine of alpha plus beta x over x squared dx. Now, sine functions are actually quite nice to deal with because of our knowledge of Dirichlet integrals. Cosine functions, not so much. They don't make a lot of sense. However, there is a way to work around this. We'll write this as one half integral from zero to infinity, negative cosine alpha plus beta x over x squared, plus we have the cosine of alpha minus beta x over x squared, and you guessed it, I need a special form of zero. And the form of zero I'll invoke this time is one over x squared minus one over x squared. That would suffice. So I have a 1 here, the name minus 1 over x squared, so I need a negative sign here, 1 and a minus to make sense of the signs. Yeah, that seems all right. So now I have a couple of very similar integrals that can be evaluated using a generalized integral function. Now I could use alpha or beta, but they're already in use, so we might as well make use of a different variable this time. Why not? the integral function i of sigma, defined as the integral from zero to infinity of one minus cosine sigma x over x squared dx. And you guessed it, we'll differentiate this thing with respect to the parameter sigma so that we have i prime on the left hand side and on the right we have the integral from zero to infinity of now the partial derivative with respect to sigma of one minus cosine sigma x over x squared dx. Differentiating gives us integral zero to infinity, one over x squared, the derivative of negative cosine is sine. So we have sine of sigma x, and by the chain rule, we have this x outside as well. Lovely cancellation taking place. So we have integral zero to infinity, of sine of sigma x over x dx. Now this is of course the famous Dirichlet integral, which we know sorts out to pi over two, but it could also sort out to negative pi over two, depending on the sign of sigma. That is, if it's positive, we get a plus pi over two, and if it's a negative, we have a minus pi over two. So the answer should be pi over two sine sgn sigma, where this thing is plus one if sigma is positive and negative one if sigma is negative. Okay, cool. So that's the derivative. And now we attempt to recover back the integral function by integrating with respect to sigma. So we have i of sigma equal to pi over two sigma sine sigma plus a constant of integration c. And this product over here equals absolute value sigma. So i of sigma equals pi over two absolute value sigma plus a constant c that we now have to determine. And this is actually pretty straightforward. Recall that i of sigma is defined as integral zero to infinity, one minus cosine sigma x over x squared dx. So plugging in sigma equal to zero will give us one minus one up top in the numerator. So the entire integral collapses to zero. 
So that means using the initial value condition of i of 0 being 0, we have 0 equal to pi over 2 times 0 plus c, implying that c equals, conveniently equals 0, that is. Awesome. So i of sigma is just pi over 2 times the absolute value of sigma. And we have two cases of the parameter. We have one case being alpha plus beta and the other case being alpha minus beta. So all of this implies that the target integral i is 1 half times pi over 2 times absolute value alpha plus beta minus alpha absolute value of alpha minus beta. Now the case of alpha and beta being positive is actually pretty neat. And of course if either one is negative we know that in the original integral we had sine of alpha x times sine of beta x and we know that sine is an odd function so in case either one of them is negative we could just swap them with the negative of let's say gamma and then pull the negative outside so yeah the result will hold either way. So the interesting case is for alpha and beta being positive. So for that case, we know that the absolute value of alpha plus beta is going to be equal to, well, alpha plus beta. So i here is going to be equal to pi over 2 times 1 half of alpha plus beta minus absolute value of alpha minus beta. And the reason I'm writing it in this form is because there's this interesting relationship for the min function, that is the minimum of alpha and beta is defined or can be defined as one half of alpha plus beta minus absolute value of alpha minus beta. And that's pretty cool because that means the target integral, that is the integral from zero to infinity of sine of alpha x over x times sine of beta x over x dx equals pi over 2 times the min of either alpha or beta, which I think is pretty neat. Is there an extension for, for this for more than two arguments? I have not investigated that yet, but if you have been or you're interested in doing so, comment down below. I hope you enjoyed the video. Be sure to like and subscribe. Thank you. See you next time.